Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight is the uh, excuse me. It's time to begin the meeting. It is 6 p.m. It is time to start SoCo Creek Water District meeting for February 21st. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. We're trying to start the meeting. Thank you. Um, so just as a note, um, all these board meetings are televised. Um, they are live on um, the website at livestream.com at SoCal Creek Water District and on channel Comcast Channel 25 and Charter Channel 71. And they're rebroadcast. That's when they're rebroadcast at 8 a.m. and Sunday at 6 p.m. So those are available. Um, tonight's meeting, we have a roll call. Shows that we're missing um, Director Jaffe and, and direct, Director Lather. Um, there is no public hearing. So the first item on tonight's agenda is the consent agenda. Any items you wish pulled from the consent? Uh, no. no. Um, I have just a few comments on the What's on Tap newsletter. So that's the only one I have want to see separately. I move approval of the others. I second it. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 And so now let me, on the What's on Tap newsletter, let me go to that. Okay. It was a small thing, actually, a couple things. Um, on the second page of the newsletter, which is on page 28 or 29 of the 255 page agenda, under Pure Water SoCal, on the left hand column in the bottom, there's a sentence that says, We view this creates a win win. So we either we review this as a win win or we this creates, it's got to be one or the other, not both. There. So just a typo. On the next page, page 30 of the agenda and three of the newsletter, um, at the very bottom left again, last paragraph, um, it says the day of the class, the students and homeowners learned about the codes. How to, So I think, I'm not sure everybody will know what they meant by the codes. Um, and so either we could just get rid of about the codes and just say learned how to safely install the gray water system continued. That would be good. And the last thing was on page 31 under the lead sampling requirement on the left hand side. I wondered if we should mention that we routinely do testing and, and the frequency of that just so People know that it, just testing for lead is not a new thing for us. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, so that is all. Okay. 
So with if you guys don't have any changes, then I'll move approval. Or no, you don't. I should just give guidance, right? So, so we don't really need a vote on that. Okay. So the next item on tonight's uh, agenda is oral communications. So this would be on any item that's not on tonight's agenda. So um, if anyone wishes to speak on those, I'll want to make a point um, for any public comment at the beginning of each item. Um, please limit your comments to three minutes. And um, we're thank you. So this is on items not on tonight's agenda. Hello, I'm Hi, Jerry. Jerry Paul. I, uh, I'm here to urge the district to take a step that I'm convinced will save the district $100 million. That means that the businesses and families of the district who actually fund the activities of the district will save a hundred million dollars. That, uh, if if you consider, there's about about thirty six thousand people in the district. Divide that by four, that might be eighty three hundred families. We're talking about twelve thousand dollars. That uh, is destined to be added to the water bill that they're already destined to pay. Um, should this sewage recycling plan go through? The alternative, in my view, is to write what I call the $100 million letter, which would be an offer from the district to the city of Santa Cruz, the city council, copy to the Board of Supervisors and other interested agencies, which would offer to pay for stream water to be treated and delivered to the district. Now the the uh, uh, the two wells, I mean the two pipelines that would have to be widened and the well that would have to be installed would be on Santa Cruz territory. And if SoCal Creek Water District paid the $27 million that it would cost to do so, they would save about $100 million because the sewage recycling capital cost is 60 to $70 million. The extra operating cost, because it's so energy intensive and uses all these filters, high maintenance is about 40 million over the first 30 years of life. And then the numbers are so high it has to be financed for maybe another 20 million, adding up to 125 million, plus or minus, let's not put too big a point on it, <coughs> or on the aquifer cost of about 27 million. The point is that there's about a hundred million dollar difference. Now, if you wrote a letter saying, Santa Cruz, if by date certain, say three years from today, you finish L'Aquifer, we'll pay for it. They may even give you financing, by the way. I've, I've heard one water commissioner say so. You'd be inclined to listen to an offer. Um, that would bring you, by the way, not just the water you're planning to get, 1,500 acre feet, but about 2.4 times that. It would satisfy your entire demand. That's a lot of water. So the savings in price times the savings in how much more water you get is a better value by at least 12 times. It's a letter you. you ought to write to do your due diligence, especially before the EIR. Thank you very much. Thank you. The SoCal Village neighborhood community is in opposition to the location of either of the two wastewater treatment facilities in our residential neighborhood. This location is known as the West Annex site, comprised of three lots that are currently owned by the SoCal Creek Water District, located on SoCal Drive between Capitola Avenue and Rosedale Avenue. Our community was left out of the discussion during preparation and approval of the feasibility study. We did not receive actual notices of the study or the meetings. Had we known, we would have participated actively. 
We, had we known, we would have objected to the purchases of the two vacant lots located in our residential community for the purpose of treating raw wastewater through a membrane bioreactor or secondary tertiary through the advanced water purification facility. Wastewater treatment, whether it is raw sewage or secondary tertiary treated water, is not appropriate for a highly residential neighborhood. We strongly oppose either of these facilities and ask that you take off the table and remove all three properties owned by the district at the West Annex site um, for further consideration for the Pure Water Soquel project. You removed the Capitola Community Center parking lot due to it being part, um, being in a quote, highly residential area and due to quote, potential community resistance. We are asking for the same considerations for the West Annex sites. There are more appropriate alternative sites, for example, in, 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 that are in industrial areas. You will face community resistance, and I now ask all the people in the audience who support the removal of all three properties in our neighborhood from further consideration by this district for the Pure Water Soquel project to please stand up, raise your hands, and be recognized before the board. And there were many more people that would have definitely wanted to be here and asked us to come here and stand in their stead. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Is there, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? We're trying to Tom? remember to limit your comments to three board, minutes. Board President, I might say that Wait. actually this item is, is actually embedded on the agenda into the status report. So I'm not sure if they should comment now, if we, but we're going to go through if they want to um, comment afterwards. Up to you. So one or the other. Yeah. Um, as long not as both. I'm here, I'll just comment now, and then maybe some other people can comment later. Uh, well, and All right. Um, my name is Marcia Noren, and I've written this out so that I won't go over time. Um, my property is on Rosedale Avenue, uh, which is almost next door to the Water District Administrative Offices. The first notification I received about the intended use for what is being called the West Annex property was via a letter dated January 27th, less than one month ago, that was hung on my doorknob. The meeting announced in that letter for a, a, that a February 2nd date, six days later, was scheduled that would allow us to receive more information and to ask questions. Being informed that a feasibility study had already been conducted without the district having received any input or feedback from us was startling. We were invited to express what features are important, specifically landscaping, location of treatment buildings, lighting, open space, etc. But our concern <laughs> is maintaining the integrity and quality of life that we have enjoyed and that we hope to enjoy for the rest of our, um, potentially forever, as long as we live there. Um, Santa Cruz County, as everybody knows, is one of the most expensive places to live in the, in the entire country. And our property taxes reflect that. Uh, residents do have the legal right to quiet enjoyment of residential property. It actually comes with your title. Um, <clears throat> and we also have the right to expect normal zoning restrictions that would apply to any neighbor who intends to encroach upon those rights, including a public utility. So Cal Village, being unincorporated, does not offer the same benefits as, say, Capitola Village. Uh, the zoning restrictions here are strictly enforced, and as a result, um, as a realtor for 30 years and an owner-operator of Thunderbird Real Estate, I can assure you that the property values are the highest of anywhere in the county right here in Capitola Village because of that consistency. <clears throat> uh, conversely, you can look at Live Oak, the neighbor right over there, and because of their mixed-use zoning, uh, property values there are not what they should be. Uh, so maintaining our property values are extremely important. Homes in res residential areas that are blighted by industry are less desirable, and property values do reflect that. So please consider the pledge that you took on January 19th of this year, your proposal to install a treatment facility or 
either one, either a tertiary or a waste in the middle of our neighborhood is not consistent with this pledge. Um, that is the green pledge. Environmental stewardship is a core value of the district and activities we perform, says Ron Duncan, district general manager, whether they are policy decisions or day to day, we should consider the impact to the environment and ways to protect it. Thank you. Thank you. So, can I? So, um, in, we're not going to be able to hear every one person come up and say the same thing. And I understand we we understand your show of of solidarity, and that's great. And if somebody's saying something that you agree with, it's fine to have a show of hands. That's wonderful. But if we could just keep comments to something new or different, I'm here to talk about that. Would be efficient. Okay. Thank you. Well, good, e good evening. Um, my name is Bob Mattali. I've, I've come here tonight to tell you how upset I am over uh, that you've chosen an utterly ridiculous location in a residential neighborhood right next to my home and my neighbor's homes um, for your industrial scale pure water SoCal pro project. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very convenient that you have a loophole, California Government Code 53091, which allows you to be exempt from local building and zoning ordinances. It's from page 2-1 in your notice of preparation. If we lived on a small island, I could see such a loophole as there wouldn't be many, there would be a lot of issues with uh, choosing a location, but we don't live on a small island and there are many other uh, locations that are appropriate that are available. Twelve of them are rich in your feasibility study and zoned for industrial. So I ask you, since the West Annex site is zoned residential, is this even ethical? You have a mission statement of core values and goals, which was approved by the board on July 9th, 2015. In your statement, you ask, what do we stand for? Under fairness, honesty, and ethics, you ask, does the decision or action treat all concerned fairly, honestly, and ethically? I don't think it was ethical or honest when you sent out a benign little postcard labeled Pure Water Soquel Project scoping meeting at the Twin Lakes Church. Most people just tossed it in the recycle bin which left the burden up to us to figure out what the project really was. Under the heading of our primary organizational goals, bullet point number three, community engagement and trust. Do you think sending out those little postcards fostered trust? I'll tell you, it fostered distrust. Under collaboration, does the decision or action promote collaboration with others? Well, we didn't get to help choose a site, so no. Where's the collaboration? You guys purchased the property, started an EIR without any input on its location from the community. Your staff is going around getting design ideas as if it's a done deal. The other facilities that you guys have looked at are not anywhere near homes. Orange County, Water District, Groundwater Re Replenishment Project in Huntington Beach. The closest distance to the nearest home, according to Google Maps, is 340 feet. A facility, guys, you were going to go look at, which is owned by Lot, located in Washington State, the Hawks Prairie Reclaimed Water Facility, is 545 feet to the nearest home, and the homes behind it are behind a line of 100-foot tall trees. Not even close. <laughs> Silicon Valley Advanced Water Purification Facility, located at the north end of Zanker Road near Alviso, is 3,470 feet to the nearest home. These distances don't even compare to what you're proposing at the West Annex site. Be a good neighbor put the project in a proper location. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott McGilvery. I live in Live Oak. I do not live in Soquel Creek Water District. But I, um, I noticed the large number of people here who are looking for some other alternative. And I want to inform the board that uh, Water for Santa Cruz County has been trying to present another alternative to a public audience since December of this last year. We attended the scoping meeting at the Twin Lakes Church where we were told that public input would be sought, there were going to be court reporters to take statements, and we were not allowed the opportunity to speak to the group of people who clearly would like to hear some other solution. This was followed by another meeting on the 13th of December at a church in Aptos in which Mr. Duncan stood up and answered questions for two hours and 20 minutes and a crowd of 140 diminished to seven. 
because we were not allowed to present the information. Um, what I would like to know from the board is when will you or will you ever allow a group of people who have studied the water that's available in Santa Cruz that has been contracted to you that you are now sending a million gallons of water under the same agreement in the other direction when will you ever allow that proposal to be presented I also wish to comment on a letter that your general manager wrote and was published in the Aptus Times in which he said that the water transfer projects costs exceed the costs of the recycled water treatment plan that is simply got no basis in fact and a letter has been written to Mr. Duncan about it I see in tonight's meeting that there is a March communication from the general manager that says there's a very small amount of water well, we've got another minute to go uh, a very small amount of water that can be studied in a pilot <coughs> project so it diminishes the potential for this in lieu water transfer a million gallons a day flowed in January in that direction and more can flow in this direction more I think it's another 40 percent more right now that over a 300 day period of time is more water than can be produced by the pure water project and Santa Cruz has water in the north coast you've now identified it as north coast so you know that it doesn't require a permit change now I'm not saying it's the be-all and the end-all but this is a proposal this is a real possibility in our community which has abundant water and you should give it full consideration as you're considering the pure water project thank you hi my name is Matt must pick um, I just wanted to say very quickly um, I would assume that your legal obligation to notify the public has been met by some standard but it's plainly obvious to me that the real purpose of any paltry public communication has been <clears throat> to evade more than inform I was not I don't I was not informed of the scope and the meaning of the project until a neighbor told me two weeks ago um, and having thoroughly reviewed the materials available <clears throat> that were sent out for public consumption uh, it just seems undeniable that there hasn't been a real clear purpose to uh, from the beginning to get public comment and public information or pub you know information out it just seems that the purpose has been to uh, sneak one by no anyway that's my perception okay thank you Hi. Uh, my name is my name is Dave Hack I live on Gary Drive um, I had some questions for you uh, since I did not get much information about this wastewater treatment plant sewage plant that's going in in our neighborhood um, nothing in the mail we got bills in the mail but we didn't get really any information um, and until I looked at this gigantic you know plan that you have I have a couple of questions um, uh, what type of odor control are you going to be using you, you, you'll have to ask staff questions later this is public comment period we'll listen okay, to your comments com so I'm not going to go into back and forth do you plan on having a security system because there are homeless people were living in there before and basically fouling up the place are you going to have a security system set up? No. Um, no, I'm not saying no. I'm saying we can't. We can't we're not going to answer those questions. Okay. This is a public this, comment this period. This you can excuse me, but you can ask the staff for the answers to those questions because that information is available. All right. But this is the time for you to make a comment, and then okay. that's it. Okay. Let me make a comment then. You got a transfer plant down by CVS Pharmacy that has uh, used to have public restrooms in it, and it doesn't anymore. You can't go in there unless you have an oxygen tank. I was down there when you have uh, uh, the, the, the last you know flooding sis, uh, situation we had prior to the one we had a day or so ago they had Santa Cruz County people there uh, apparently Santa Cruz County and Cap City Capitola run that one in the and the transfer station down at Capitola Beach 
and they were having problems with it, and it stunk to high heavens. You can't go to the bathroom anymore. The public restrooms are closed, and they have a sign there that says, do not enter without having an oxygen tank. Um, so are we going to have the same problems with this? I'm asking questions again. I think we're going to have the same problems with this. I think there's going to be an odor problem, and us living on Gary Drive are going to be affected the most. And um, I think anybody that lives within a mile of the area is going to, or even further. Um, I have notes here from, um, uh, it's basically buying a house near a sewage treatment plant. It's a blog head, and there's, there's Pete, this guy that's worked at a, a plant for 18 years says, ask these questions, and apparently this is not the time to do it, but I will later. But anyway, uh, that's basically all I have to say about that. Okay. Uh, you also have a big homeless problem at the, at both of these transfer stations in Capitola, and that's uh, somebody on our block made a um, comment about the homeless situation that was there prior to you guys gating the place up and closing it up to them. So uh, anyway. I was just curious about that. Okay. Uh, so, any additional different comments, <laughs> or just something additional? Um, trying to. Learn. I believe it's somewhat different, but it's still in the same category as long as well as what everybody's been saying. My name is Gina Marie Tambellini. I am a homeowner here in Soquel. I found out about this from the Nextdoor app social media site. Um, I found out from Bob Metalia, and I want to thank him for putting that on the Nextdoor app. Um, I think it's absolutely disgusting that I had to find out that way. And um, I, along with other people in our community, will be fighting this. We will be signing a petition that is currently being signed by many people in our community. And we will not stop until this is no longer an issue. Because we will absolutely, 100%, refuse to have this sewage plant in our residential community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Monet Templeton, and I'm an educational neuropsychologist. And I just moved here like a week ago. I live up the street from where the plant is being proposed. And I strongly oppose the development of this wastewater treatment plant um, due to my work with special needs children, actually, and their families. There has been extensive research indicating the negative impacts of toxic exposure on in utero development, childhood development, as well as adult health. Um, there's also been research that wastewater treatment plants cause toxicity through the drinking water, um, the sewage sludge, and the potential for spills. And since I have another minute or so, I'm going to just mention a couple of the research articles that I referenced very briefly today before I came from the University of Chicago, University of Davis, Department of Public Health, the American Chemical Society, Scientific American, Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health, and the Journal of Water Research. Um, specifically, there's use of chlorine in chemical oxidation, the chemical oxidation process, and that is being picked up as, as, as traces within the water, as well as the presence of pharmaceuticals in the treated water. Um, as well as the sludge, which contains these chemicals, along with antibiotic-resistant bacteria and such. So this actually leads to increased incidences of autism, intellectual disabilities, ADHD, and other preventable diseases, as well as inflammation that can be, that can be caused in all of us. This can cause inflammation, and this can impact the maternal the pregnancies and in utero because, again, there's research reflecting um, increased autism with maternal inflammation. And on a personal note, I actually have a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disease. So I was actually appalled to move into my forever home a short time ago and realize that this is going to be built. 
So on that note, I just want to say that I strongly oppose and will be actively opposed to this wastewater treatment plan development in my neighborhood. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbruner. I'm a resident of Aptos Hills and a customer of Pure Source Water, which also relies upon the same aquifer as does SoCal Creek Water District customers. And I'm against the district injecting treated wastewater into my water supply without having any vote or say on it. Um, I applaud all the people here tonight out to uh, defend their neighborhood and speak up and let you know how they feel. It was not an easy thing to do at your December 7th meetings when the public was not allowed to speak out loud. I attended your um, uh, supplemental supply committee meeting in which the Corolla engineers talked about this process that you are uh, calling your preferred project. Um, it's in the EIR process, <coughs> which to me means that it is in the EIR process and no, nothing has been decided yet before all of the alternatives are considered. But you've already done the feasibility report um, almost a year ago for this. And you've already contracted with Corolla engineers. They've, they said right in that meeting, this is a big energy hog. It's an energy hog. And you've already contracted with them to do a, a study this summer of all of the contaminants that is in the wastewater treatment. In there, um, and, and already you've gotten letters of support from Monning and Stone and Mr. Duncan was at the Santa Cruz County Water Advisory Commission asking them for a letter of support to urge the County Board of Supervisors to approve it. I thought we were in the EIR process. And to me, this is not the preferred project. You are viewing it as the project. And I'm opposed to it, as are many here in this room and beyond. Um, one thing that um, the Corolla engineers talked about in their studies that have come up from Oxnard is that there are chemicals, and uh, they didn't even talk about the microorganisms that make it through. The cryptosporidium oocytes, the giardia, the viruses, the noroviruses that make it, can make it through and are highly toxic. But they talked about the MDMA that did make it through the advanced treated process, but was under acceptable health limits. Well, I looked up that, <laughs> that chemical. It's a, it's a liver toxin. And at, maybe it is below the, the legal health limits, but that's one thing that the advisory group for the state water boards talking about um, IPR and direct potable resource said there's not enough information known about the effects, long-term effects of trace exposure and low dosage of these unknown contaminants. Sure. I want to know that you're not going to do this without putting it to a full vote of the people, not a protest vote, a full vote. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, board, board president, that, that's the end of the oral communications. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like that? to note for the record that there was misinformation provided by that lady just now regarding my comments. So just note that, please. Okay. Okay, so anyway, so we, under, we hear what you're saying, and we understand that you don't want it in the neighborhood no matter what it is. I would say that it tell, you know, we obviously you know, listen to what you've said, so thank you for coming. It is important to speak what you think. And so um, I think that it points out to me that we still have to get some better information out there to you to make sure you understand you still want to put it in our I'm not saying anything right now we're not making any decision on anything until an environmental impact study is done and that environmental impact study may not even include a treatment of raw wastewater so let's you're, you know I, I understand your worry but I'd like it not to be out of um, context with what the p possibilities are so thank you for letting us know I think we definitely need to keep you informed on what we're thinking and 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 so that's all yeah if I, if I might suggest um, because it may be of interest to these people uh, item 5.3 the status report does have some inf information related that we were planning on presenting so that's fine we, you might want to accelerate that item for tonight's purposes 
Well, yeah, we could. Um, if that w that's probably a good idea, then you guys don't have to hang out for all the mo things that are probably not as interesting to you. Um, <laughs> which status report are you uh, saying? 5.3, it's the um, organizational-wide status report. Okay, that's fine. And we'll, we will go in kind of uh, order. Just on a conservation note, uh, we're about 6.5 inches short of uh, one of the thresholds the boy, board uses for how they uh, declare um, emergency situations in respect to rainfall. We know there's a host of other things, groundwater levels and whatnot. So just a heads up on that. And then I think Shelley wanted to mention something about stormwater. Yeah, at the last meeting we presented an update on uh, some regional stormwater recharge work that's been done and um, also some of the things that we've looked at as staff. Um, we are just getting involved in this process and we did promise to keep the board updated um, in increments as well as that three month uh, update that we're gonna come back with a more formal update. The county did have a hosted a meeting last Friday and that was to take a look at the managed aquifer recharge layers that were developed by UC Santa Cruz Hydrogeology Group, Dr. Andy Fisher and the RCD, where they looked at um, the Pajaro Valley watershed, the Mid-County watershed, San Lorenzo Valley, and also Scotts Valley, and basically um, created these recharge suitability maps that compri are comprised of various layers. And so the meeting focused on the work that they had done and how to best look at those layers and evaluate them in terms of potential, identifying potential sites where recharge could be done on you know a, a relatively medium-sized scale. So we're not talking about huge volumes of water here, but in the range of 10 to 100 acre feet. And um, it was a really great meet meeting, learning how they did all of their work and how to best use those layers. It's not as simple as just looking at the green and the pink that we, we showed you mm -hmm. uh, last time around. You can really dive in deeper if there's some sites that hold potential, possibly properties that you own. Um, maybe they're not green, but uh, you know, you can take a deeper look in within those layers and see if it makes sense to continue investigating those sites. And so really our next steps are to um, continue using the layers and going back and doing another analysis with the properties that the district owns. We're gonna do that internally. Okay. Uh, the county is really taking a lead on other publicly held properties and large privately owned properties in the district or in, yeah, in the mid-county area. So the first step is really to pinpoint some ideal sites and then to move ahead and do some additional studies, some push tests to uh, look at uh, what can actually get down into the basin and where do we really want the water to get to. And hopefully from there, if those investigations look good, then we would bring in our hydrogeologist and try and get some estimates of quantity. Uh, that's kind of the tricky part is figuring out how much water can actually mm -hmm. get down to where you want it to be. So things are moving along and I just wanted to give you an update on that. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll hop to the... Uh, hop to the special projects? Yeah, yeah yes. special projects par portion of it. Uh, while Melanie brings that up, I'll mention that uh, operationally we're hanging in there. There's been a few issues but um, right. we're holding together better than I think a lot of other agencies are so you know the, the crowds obviously interested in the pure water SoCal project that we're evaluating uh, and we are in the EIR stage the board a while back sent out some guiding principles um, because we have heard you along the way we heard uh, and this has been a prominent theme in the meeting we do not want uh, treated uh, to you to treat untreated uh, wastewater on the facility. We have heard that we can may work with you on treated water if it's secondary or tertiary. Tertiary is what they put on football fields and things. Okay, from some people. They, he, from some please. people in the meetings that we've, we've me, been to. We've had meetings, just let him have. talk. And so we put we incorporate that into our guiding principles. We've also heard that you know people would like it at another site if possible, so we're evaluating that. So those, those have been incorporated 
to show you where we're what we're trying to do and what we're where we're headed. We're working currently with the city of Santa Cruz on a contract for tertiary treated water. That's water we've passed bottles of secondary, have no odor. No odor. We should have brought one tonight. Maybe somebody in the crowd, has anybody in the crowd had smelt one of those bottles? I think I see some people here. Tertiary is what they apply to organic crops and playing fields. So that's the type of affluent we're get, we're looking at. It's not a sewage treatment plant. It's taking water that can be applied to crops, uh, fields, and that sort of thing, and then and then uh, running through some filters to polish it. So that's that's what we're looking at. And with that, I don't know, about uh, two weeks ago, we had neighbors from each street, and actually, um, so from Rosedale, Gary, Capitola, and Azul, and they came, and that fostered out of another meeting that was down here to, to, to look at if, we, if you did have a facility there that treated, uh, that polished this water, what could it look like? Imagine what could, you, what could be acceptable and the kind of things we heard. And Melanie's going to run through that and show you some of the slides that we went through. So, We were very fortunate to get representatives from Gary Drive, Capitola Avenue, Bishop Lane, Rosedale, and Agazul across from Soquel Drive to meet with staff and our technical advisor to do what Ron said, just to kind of envision what could be um, at that West Annex site. I know that there's a lot of um, concerns that we're moving forward with designing at that site. I did want to just point out before I go too far into this that another one of the guiding principles that the board has identified, and the guiding principles are online, was to also review a list of other potential treatment site locations. So staff is doing that. I don't want you to think that we're not doing that. It's on a parallel track of what we're showing and doing tonight. And that list is to come back on March 7th for the board to decide and consider whether or not they also want to look at other sites. Um, what was really, what the board came from input we received already is that the neighbors did not want this site to have a membrane bioreactor. So when we met in February with the neighbors, we only focused on facilities that would be for the polishing of secondary or tertiary water. This would not have a raw wastewater stream coming into the facility. This would be a drinking water plant that would purify the water to then um, replenish the groundwater basin. But with that, you know, um, you, everybody is right. We had a feasibility study that was done, and it had um, some maps and layouts that were deceiving to the public because they weren't done with much forethought. It was done with looking at equipment, putting it on the site, and we really wanted to have drawings and designs that go into the environmental impact report that were more representative of what the facility could be. These are just some examples of layouts. Again, just as a refresher, this is the site that uh, the district has purchased um, that does include the, m the different um, parcels that would comprise what we're considering the West Annex. The main driver for what I just mentioned were these maps that were in part of the feasibility study that we wanted to get rid of. Um, both from for the EIR, but really for the public to understand what we're considering. Um, we wanted to provide that these did not have any landscape considerations. We agree that there was no um, true input from neighbors in the area, and these had the MBR component, the membrane bioreactor component that would not be needed if we're treating uh, effluent from the city of Santa Cruz. We also want to make sure that there's maps out there that can clarify the misinformation and misrepresentation that's being circulated by the public. This is another illustration um, of, of what the proposed facility may look like. Um, this is, I think, a, an oil refractory in France. So just wanted to, you know, these are the kinds of things that we can say, this isn't what it's going to look like. This is what, what we're hoping the facility would be and would, would look like. I, I, and Melanie, did you want to add, a lot of people seem to uh, um, uh, not understand what's down there at um, Knob Hill. That's a sewage lift station with open pipes that lifts raw sewage up to an elevation that can continue to flow to, to toward the city of Santa Cruz. All the sewage goes that way from your house. It flows down there and goes there. Those are open pipes. 
That's not, I want to make it clear, that's not anything. I mean, we're not even talking about raw sewage now. We're talking about treated affluent secondary or tertiary standards. So, and that, you know, has air gaps. We're talking about a completely enclosed system. So another misconception and, and easily understood why, you know, it stinks down there. And we're not talking about that. Okay. Please go on. So quickly, we, we, we showed some kind of facil treatment facilities that are built for other water agencies, either in California or even through the U.S., just to kind of set the, the visioning with the, with the neighbors of what, uh, what an existing water treatment facility could look like. What do ones look like that uh, were in neighborhoods, were not in neighborhoods, received uh, community input, or, you know, were done just with the organization. So again, this is what uh, facility that, that's in Lot, which is in Washington, this is a desalter facility per, uh, in Pleasanton. And, and let, me, let me make a note. You see that 6 MGD facility? That's just water talk for 6 million gallons a day. The facility we're talking about is 1.5. So almost all these facilities are much, much larger. I don't know. That's what a factor of three or something. Larger or four than what we're talking about. So all those pictures are like that. Thank you. This is a facility in um, Santa Monica, and um, it's right in here. And uh, our consultant had put this picture in here just to kind of show that, that it was ne next to a school as well as a neighborhood. This is what it looked like from the street. Um, this was a facility that was done um, to look like a barn that was on purpose based on input. Um, this is over in Oxnard. This is another desalter. Desalter is a reverse osmosis membrane facility like what, we're being, what is being proposed at the Pure Water SoCal. Um, this is one up in near Sacramento area. Um, the input that they received from their community was that they wanted it to look somewhat like a house. Uh, this is one in Arizona. And then this is an illustration just of two facilities that the SoCal Creek Water District currently has. We have 18 wells and 15 tanks. Our system is very uh, distributed within our service area. The Garnet Well and Treatment Facility is in the city of Capitola in the Jewel Box on Garnet Street. And the O'Neill Well and Treatment Facility was just put in on SoCal near 41st Avenue uh, on the bottom. How many people have been down, Gar is it Garnet Street? I mean, I think almost everybody's probably been over there in the Jewel Box. Anyway, we, that, this is the facility. You may not even recognize it, uh, but it's a, it's a large well treatment. Um, part of it's underground, part of it's above ground, but that's up there in the upper left. Okay. I would, I would hope I'm not putting Chris on the spot, um, but would you like to report out what was the input or I can, or I can if you're uncomfortable? Yeah. Yeah, I was going, I, what I want to do is, you know, we are about trying to be open and transparent with what the input was from the neighbors that night. Um, this is kind of a list that I captured, but we, we have, since you were at the meeting, if you don't mind me letting Chris you Chris is one of the neighbors, I believe, on Rosedale, right? That's correct. That attended, I think, a handful of six or seven people that came from the public. We didn't know you were even going to be here tonight. But... The, and okay. we're asking him specifically okay, to... Okay, so let's, let's just clarify. Um, Is there one comment no, it's not. No. And then to comment on the meeting, thank you. For, okay. Did you want to... Okay. They had a meeting, and she's just asking for input from the meeting. I can... Okay. I, okay, let's... let's maybe never mind, Chris. Chris. Let's just, let's just, in really the interest sorry. of thank just you, being Chris. efficient sorry. with our... Thank you. No, thank you. We've had, we've had lots so. of public comment. We understand how you so feel. Let Melanie just summarize I'm, I'm the finding. I'm sorry I put you in that and spot. Let's let me... Any more yeah, hands that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Let me just... Sum, I'll summarize um, what was received from the comments from those that attended that neighborhood meeting that night. Um, there was a general understanding from those that um, we have a serious water supply issue and that seawater intrusion is occurring in our aquifers and that uh, we do need to uh, fix that issue, provide a sustainable water supply um, to meet the California state mandates of a, a water supply by 2040. 
Um, the community input was no MBR process, really try to secure the secondary or tertiary water, um, no noise, no old odor. Um, include lots and lots of landscaping on the property as well as the entire district office. Some of the input we did receive from the public that night, directors, is that the, the site could use landscaping not just at the West Annex site, but also um, on Soquel Drive and on Rosedale as well as um, the property abutments near Bishop and, and Capitola. Um, do some of the landscaping now to get established. A focus on the buildings within the existing district site um, and the PG&E substation. So really focusing on that upper portion of the west side annex that is vacant. Um, the input we also received included, you know, <coughs> prefer no visitor education center or park unless it was restricted. There was a lot of um, input and in, in, um, concerns from um, the neighbors about construction impacts. Uh, specifically to when the facilities were being built as well as property values and the direct impact to neighbors, how would they be compensated. Um, again, like I mentioned before, uh, we did talk at, at length about the location is in a neighborhood and to consider and move to another site. This is just a picture that, you know, we, we do recognize that community impu input is important. This is from the scoping meeting as well as the community meeting in December. I will mention that um, our EIR consultants have prepared a draft scoping report um, that we hope will be done by next month. They're just finishing compiling all of the comments and all of the notifications that were sent out into a report that we'll provide to the board and put on the website. Some of the people that have provided comments um, in the EIR process ask that their information not be shared publicly under you know, um, the Privacy Act. So those the, their private information is being taken out. Those that did not say that we couldn't share, we are including those. So once that report is done, we'll be providing that to the board. And then just to wrap up, the anticipated schedule for these um, new layouts is to have a draft, draft layout plan by April to come back to the board and to be um, shared to the public. Okay. Thank you. Any other parts of the staff meeting? There's a, this is the overall, yeah. overall staff. Um, I just would add to that report. that we're hoping to come back in uh, early April. If we don't make that meeting, it'll, it'll have to be... Um, you know, after that in later April, but with that, with a contract with the city of Santa Cruz for uh, treated uh, secondary or tertiary, and we're aiming for tertiary affluent. So that's another aspect of that timeline. And regarding the other reports, except for uh, legal counsel's report, we don't really have anything to add. So if I have questions on the engineering report? Yeah, or any of those reports, you're welcome to ask us. Okay. Um, so I have a couple questions on that one. Do you have questions on other status reports? Okay. Engineering, um, on some of these um, reports, and maybe it's just, um, I still like to know, um, have the updates and the, like, even if it says in progress, there were a lot of them that just said in progress, but um, <coughs> it'd be great if they said, you know, kind of percent completed and expected completion date kind of thing um, on, on some of those. Um, so, and I, one of those was the one on the review of the pipe loop testing for um, surface water pilot project with San City of Santa Cruz. It just, um, there was a meeting scheduled in January, so I wondered if we had an update on that. We've received two proposals to do that, and we are waiting on the third uh, proposal from uh, a, the final consultant. So it's been delayed a little bit. We'll get that rolling. Okay. Shortly. <coughs> they had some questions that we needed to uh, provide answers for. Okay. That was the main one I had questions about. <coughs> Either of you have questions on engineering? Um, no. <laughs> okay. Anything <coughs> on operations and maintenance? Thanks, Tosh. We'll have public comment for sure on the on this organizational staff report right after they've given the updates. I thought there were little. Any, any questions for the engineer report? Is now the time to do 
Not yet. I'm going to just do them all together. Okay. Thanks. Um, and operations. Any questions from the board on operations and maintenance? Uh, no, I'll just summarize for that. They, there's a lot going on, obviously, in there. Uh, a few, you know, issues with the water and, and earth moving and that sort of thing. But uh, I think the staff's doing a great job of, of holding it all together, considering the situation, what's going on in Santa Cruz County. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then there was finance. Any questions on finance? I'll note something on that, that there is an uptick in water, you know, as amazing as it is, as it is and how wet it was in the month of January and, you know, we're sh critically designated as a critically overdrafted aquifer and short water. Um, usage actually goes up in, in the m month of January and as hard as all the rain and, and the best we can figure, this is relative to last January, is that people just associate the rain with solving the problem and you know as hard as we try to say that it could rain you know like this for many years and it wouldn't even you know wouldn't solve the problem and certainly this rain doesn't make a very big yeah. dent at all in solving the problem so just <coughs> a little discouraging to see an uptick but uh we'll work on that I like well, i'd like to just a comment on that that i was going to bring that up too because i we went to the i went to a briefing with Alyssa abby uh, on the D uh, Governor Brown's latest proclamation on water conservation. And uh, he, I asked uh, the vice chair of the state water board what, whether they'd observed that uptick, if they, how, did they have a, was there anything in the conservation plan or the recommendations that would ad address that? Was, I called it conservation fatigue mm -hmm. in a way. It was just, uh, she said, no, no. We're not noticing it anywhere in the state. And I asked a few people in the audience, and they were seeing the same thing in their water districts. So it's just uh, that it's yeah. not in the resolution that he signed. Okay. Hey, any questions on human resources or finance? Uh, no. Okay. So I think that's all of the uh, legal counsel. Legal counsel. Sorry. Was that part of that? Yeah. Sorry, I I really have nothing to add from what I've told you in the past. There is a there is a pro pending problem at the Pringle tank, um, with an uphill landowner who has redirected water. In effect, that's coming down, and we're going to be dealing with that in the next couple of weeks. But other than that, there's nothing that needs to take up the board's time at this point. Okay. So then if there's any public comment on the organization-wide status report, item 5.3. I think, Becky, you had something? Yeah. On item, the, these staff reports that we just took in, if you have comment on those, this is the time. Thank you. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Um, I have three um, comments, questions, um, and one is most pertinent to what these people, I think, are here. Um, the uh, West Annex treatment plant would be an industrial use, land use. Is that allowed with this area in the residential district? Um, would it need to have a change in land use designation? My second question is uh, for engineering and, and maybe water quality. Um, what's the status of the O'Neill well? Is it still shut down due to the high ammonium uh, in the water? And um, the third question is, what's the status of the new Granite Way well in the Aptos Village project? Um, I'm seeing some activity, but I'm just curious what the pipes in the big bag of white, the big white <coughs> bag is for. And Thank you. I'm sure the staff can address your questions later. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just two quick questions. Uh, one is, I wonder if the primary treatment has been taken off of the table? Is and my second question is if uh, I would like to request to, we're all familiar with the um, odor that has come at times from the facility at Knob Hill, and I understand that that's a different kind of facility. Not a facility. Just a pump station. It's just a pump station. Whatever it is, it's a yeah. different kind of thing. Um, what I would request to receive was, is what kind of representations were made about that facility? when that was being planned because that would go to the dependability of the information being offered now okay thank you 
And may, we, may all of us receive a summation of those representations in the mail. You know, that's not a, that's not a water district facility. So you would have to go to the County of Santa Cruz Sanitation Department for that because that was not, it's not a Soquel Creek Water District facility at all. So we don't have that We don't have that information. My name is Mona Salvage and I live on Crystal Heights. And I have several questions, but my biggest question, and I brought this up at the last meeting, is why are the people on Crystal Heights not notified of any of this? We live across the street, directly across the street from your building, driveway going in and out with your big trucks already. We're involved. We're uphill. You've got to invite, notify the whole neighborhood, which circums a lot of room there. Okay. Secondly, there's a large piece of property that you bought. And this will sound like an accusation, and it probably is, but the things that happen when decisions are made sometimes, and there's the divide and conquer aspect, you put one, you might have five items, you put the first one on the table, you get by it, got that accepted, you go to the second one, etc. You've got a large piece of land here, you're talking about the judiciary water, I can't pronounce exactly water they'll be treated secondly are you going to put on in writing in the deed that there will be no sewage transfer property on that property will you do that no no we're, we, the other thing i have to say I answer your question when you talk about the garden <coughs> treatment facility or well facility and the treatment there the treatment of well water is totally different than the type of water that you're talking about treating at this facility. So don't confuse the two. And I have one more thing, I believe. Well, anyway, those are my th main okay. things. But Thank Crystal you. Heights, there are entities, there are people living on Crystal Heights, and let us know what's going on. Do we know? Meet with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, it, sorry, we have, I'm going to just address something is that, you know, we're listening to what you have to say. We will, we obviously want to keep everybody, we do want to keep everybody informed. And so I, I know notes are being taken to how to inform everybody. Sorry. Yes. I just had something really per pertinent to what Melanie had mentioned. You talked about the uh, Hawks Prairie reclaimed water facility. You specifically mentioned that in uh, the, the report you just gave. Um, According to Google Maps, uh, it's 545 feet to the nearest resident. We saw that. Um, Understood. Here's Terminal Island. It's on a. It's on an island, <laughs> surrounded by water. Uh, the Silicon Valley Advanced Water Purification Facility. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Right, we got your point. Okay. You made those before. And you know, and the, the last thing was just you know. The, uh, the French factory. I mean, let's not be hypocritical here. You, you guys tried to sneak it past us with a little postcard and misinformation, you know, and with no information. So it sounds hypocritical when you, when you bring that thing up. So. Good. Okay. All right. That's the end of that public comment period. We'll go to item 5.1, special board assignment status <coughs> report. Oh, sorry. Didn't see you there. No, this was in, to the, her public outreach report um, that the design meeting, there were people from the neighborhood, but they weren't necessarily representatives of the neighborhood. Um, my understanding, there were just a handful of people that you were representing are speaking for the whole neighborhood. That's not accurate. And so it's important, just as the previous resident pointed out, that you need to not just be reactive to people coming to you complain about not knowing about things and then you respond to those particular groups of people or those particular streets but that you have to be if you are you have a public outreach committee this is a proactive and you need to notify a huge group of people not just one party supposedly representing um, right. position so your report saying that this is where the neighborhood is wanting this to go and this is how they want you know you're representing that that's a sanction that this is what we want and that's not accurate so just I'm putting you folks on notice you're going to have to do a thorough mailing 
and having a huge room for people to have input for and all these other people that are from all these other neighborhoods that also have an input in it so um, you know that can't be the other uh, items that you did on the PowerPoint relative that these facilities are out in the middle of fields the majority of them and they're not in in residential and the one couple of the residential they're in the middle of a highway on one side and the other and um, you're representing that it's um, you know that these things are not a problem to be putting in a residential neighborhood and that's not not accurate either okay. thank you President LaHue President LaHue can I just say I, I'm sorry if I misrepresented the meeting um, I was not speaking you know we did have a very small group of neighbors represent so I don't want to Understood. overstep that and I just wanted to say that um, the sites that I was representing and showing that night to the neighbors wasn't to justify the location I know that there are issues related to proximity it was just to kind of so brainstorm like. yeah right. thank you yes sir yes hi uh, my name is Chris Riopel I live on Rosedale um, address I want to address my comments both to the board and, and to the audience um, just to make sure that um, what the nature of my involvement in that meeting was, um, I volunteered to provide input, uh, not representing my community, and I think I was clear in the meeting that I had no power to represent the interests of anybody else, but as an interested party. Um, and I think, I hope I was also clear that I was putting my own interests behind the interests of my neighbors that were much more closely abutting the property. Um, but since nobody else had volunteered from Rosedale, um, I wanted to be a, a part of the process. Uh, I also would like it to be on record that I was very clear that I don't want a sewage treatment plant in my neighborhood, uh, and I stand with my neighbors on that. Um, you know, if, if it were the last possible option, I wanted to make sure that I at least had some input on it. And the philosophy <coughs> I brought to the meeting was uh, through the process of engagement with the district, uh, would it be possible to actually have a, an outcome that was not worse than the way it is now, but in fact an improvement over the way it is now? But I was pretty clear that, um, and I think my neighbors are concerned that there's potential for scope creep. You know, there's a lot of property involved now. There was a house that was purchased and demolished and now a, a couple of adjacent lots. There's a big area, and I understand why the district would probably want that as a, potentially as a preferred location. It's obviously c convenient to the offices. But I think my neighbors um, have a very good point to be concerned about what might happen down the road if a new facility were built uh, and there were a need for additional sewage treatment were to come up in the future. So I just wanted uh, to be on record as saying I provided my input as design input for this as an alternative, but I want to reiterate what I said in the meeting, which was I would like to see the, uh, the, the plans and the proposals for the other sites and that the Rosedale Avenue is, uh, excuse me, uh, SoCal Drive is the, our last option, not our first option. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. So next item is 5.1, Special Board Assignment Status Report. Yeah, pull that up. Um, actually, not much to report here. A lot of the items that uh, have been put on, we're, we're hitting them pretty quickly except you know except for the long st standing <laughs> I will say that the first item Silicon Valley purified uh, water results that report they had come out was uh, oh. is available right and out is it on the website now yeah is it on the website yeah Good. so and the results are positive in terms of what uh, using mm -hmm. using the water for groundwater replenishment right. and board planning calendar yeah the board planning calendar uh, I'll add um, well, it's, it's all there. There is a Mid-County Groundwater Agency meeting coming up. Uh, I am thinking of moving the uh, general manager review process to later in April so we have all five board members, so I'll, I'll re revamp that one. And nothing else particular there to, to, to point out. Any public comment on the board planning calendar? Okay. Um. So we go to public outreach committee summary and oral report. Yeah, we held a meeting. Um, 
on February 14th uh, regarding uh, the district's 2017 WaterWise Education Series. Uh, we got about five, uh, uh, four events coming up for that. They are advertised on our website if people are interested in uh, well site monitoring. I think uh, some of the projects we discussed tonight will be on there. Uh, looking forward to public engagement on that. Um, um, and that's about all I'll say on that. It's open to um, uh, the board members, of course, who were attending that. Um, and I know for the supplemental supply committee, we have a member of the public. We have Larry Freeman here. He might want to comment on the next item. Okay. Um, any comments from you, Carla? Or any public comment on the public outreach committee meeting? Okay, seeing none, go ahead. <coughs> okay. Do you have anything? No? Uh, no, it was okay. a very good presentation. Right. Actually, I did receive, was there for the presentation by uh, Carollo, and I thought that was well, a that very thorough summary of the a supplemental supply. Well, that was supplemental supply meeting. I was talking about public outreach. Oh, oh I thought we moved on to. No, just checking. Well, that's Larry. I know. Okay. So I will say that in public outreach, we, with those WaterWise um, get-togethers of four different things throughout the year that were being organized for um, well tour and some other lectures, um, we kind of went over the fact that at each one we need to make sure we're clarifying what our problem is, you know, how serious the overdraft situation is, why we need supplemental water, and and that fact that the rain as great as it can be is not going to solve the longer term problem. So just that that's going to be emphasized at each one. Yeah. And, you know, I, I one of those uh, seminars and Melanie, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're because you're leading it, but uh, is about this uh, water purification process at Pure Water because it's I know it's foreign to a lot of people and it's taken me a while to, to grasp it. So, you know, what's it look like? What do these components sound like? That sort of thing. Okay, so then, sorry, then now next next item is the supplemental supply meeting summary. So anybody have a comment on that one? Okay, and any updates? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll echo what um, Director Christensen said. We had uh, uh, Mr. Sullivan, uh, I think I called him Dr. Sullivan, I elevated him um, in the memo by accident, but uh, he gave a great presentation, which we're going to bring back to the board on March 7th. He'll be here. He's one of the foremost authorities in water reuse. He'll be presenting here in front of the board, and I encourage you and your neighbors to, to come who are interested in this sort of thing. This is one of the experts in the world, really, and uh, hear what he has to say. He gave a, a little uh, abbreviated PowerPoint here uh, to the Supplemental Supply Standing Committee, and um, and then it was so well received that we want to bring him back mm -hmm. to present to the whole board and so that, you know more public can, can see it too. It's kind of an update on what's really going on in, in water purification in the in the in California today. So I encourage everybody to, to attend that that's interested in that subject. Okay. Um, next item is five point six midterm report for trout gulch. Okay. Um the district and Trout Gulch Mutual Water Company have an uh, emergency intertie. Um, the last time the agreement for that intertie was renewed five years ago, um, the board, I mean two and a half years ago, the board asked that a midterm report be presented. Um, so we are at that midterm point two and a half years into the agreement and um, uh, the update is with respect to their metering progre progress and it did go um, from 95% of their services metered to 99% and they have two um, services that are unmetered right now and are planning to install meters in this spring. Um, representatives from Trout Gulch are here if anyone has any questions <coughs> for them. No, that's great. Thank you for good progress on metering and sounds like conservation efforts have been successful as well. So thank you. Um, item 6.2, 
um, recognition of the district's finance and budget awards. Yes. So, can you hold on? This? We're very, really, really fortunate um, in the last year to have uh, Leslie Schrom as our finance <laughs> manager. We know about a year ago with um, water, our customers saving so much water and doing such a great job. We know that impacts our revenue. So, to the best of our ability, we reduce staff to uh, I think four staff members uh, most of them were temporary but we also um, back burnered a bunch of projects that comes up later tonight but through that we we took the opportunity Leslie did to use the budget as more of a, um, a guidance tool than just a just a numbers budget and so she's been in this year brought to the district two awards. Um, this one shown up on the screen is from the California Society of Municipal, uh, Municipal Finance Officers. And then um, the other one was given about a, um, a month ago to, to uh, uh, the Government Finance Officers of Association of the United States and Canada. So we have both those. Uh, we have the uh, federal award up there or the national and international and then the uh, state one here so this is really tonight about just recognizing acknowledging uh, the good work and accepting um, the distinguished budget presentation award from uh, the national uh, government uh, finance officer association of the united states and canada and the california society of municipal finance officers in uh, an award for operating budget excellence I just want to add just, you know, when Leslie, I just want to thank you because when you took over, instead of just saying, well, I'll just continue and do the best I can, you went, well, how can we make this better? How can we make this transparent? How can we make this involve staff? How can we use this as a way to make sure we're clear on our priorities? And so I just want to really thank you for that. Good job. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's very much a team effort. So I appreciate the board's input and staff's input and the input of my team. Um, you want to go to this one? There's and, a few, and actually, there's a, we were going to take a, a picture tonight, but we thought we'd wait till the whole board uh, comes back so we can get that's that. That's great. Let's do Is that. Is that okay? And then we can. They're uh, waiting for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So it, it says there's a motion to accept the awards. Yes. So anybody willing? I'll make a motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you again. Um, all right, item 6.3, infrastructure maintenance reserve. Back so, to nuts and bolts. Oddly enough, <laughs> this kind of uh, is an offshoot of the budget process itself because during the um, budget formulation process last year, one of the things that we identified was a, a need to continue uh, our commitment to investing in our existing water system infrastructure. And to that end, the board um, authorized the formation of an infrastructure maintenance reserve that we would use in subsequent years to help fund some of those main maintenance and replacement projects. And what we were kind of waiting on was the um, finalization of our uh, financial statements, the audited financial statements in December. And we were able to identify as part of that process that um, there was a gain in net position, unrestricted net position of about $1.3 million. And so the question that we have of the board tonight is to um, give us guidance on how much of that reserve you would like us to, or how much of that unrestricted gain in net position you would like us to utilize to set up the infrastructure maintenance reserve. And this new reserve will actually be utilized in formulating the 2017-18 budget. Okay, any public comment on this item? Okay, board comment? Bruce? I like to see things laid out clearly versus having a kind of, we might term this a slush fund. So, I, and we do the budget each year, and we usually do a mid-course correction, so like every six months, you know, things, things do change, like we are changing now from the SoCal <coughs> drive work to the uh, clubhouse work, and that's good. But I like to see them spelled out. And so um, it's nice to have some money for things that just c come up quickly and you have to deal with. But I don't think this should be the way we run our business, of having a giant fund and money just gets taken out of it. So I'm, I'm not a f fan of doing it this way. I'd be willing to put some money in for 
little things that crop up, you know, like some damage from the rains or whatever. But uh, I don't see the need mm -hmm. to have this. Just to clarify, this this wouldn't be a fund that we would tap without board authorization. This would simply be setting funds aside that would be utilized during the budget formulation process, kind of like our COP funds. We we bring that to the board and we say these are the projects that we would like to fund this budget year utilizing these funds. This would be that type of reserve where we, we would be bringing projects to you during every budget cycle and saying these are the projects that I think we could f fund out of this infrastructure maintenance reserve. But what it is doing is it's simply taking the money and putting it aside and kind of dedicating it toward those infrastructure maintenance prog projects so they don't get kind of lost in that budget shuffle a little bit. And I think we have more than enough maintenance projects to... Right. I mean, that's again, that's what happened at the budget uh, level last year is we couldn't fund nearly what we wanted. I mean, over half probably got sliced. But we recognize, you know, if we don't keep up with our infrastructure, it's a, you can do it for a short term, but it for, it's a, a losing long term proposition. So this is trying to take any money that's available and put it in there for, um, for that long term effort. So where would that money go exactly? Is this pro money that wasn't used for originally budgeted projects? <clears throat> no, this was, this was the gain in net position. So at the end of every fiscal year, they take a look at what we've brought in in revenue and what we spin out in, in oh, expenses. Slight, and yeah. the difference between those two is, is called gain in net position. Um, if you were a for-profit entity, it would be called net income. Mm -hmm. um, now, this happens when uh, revenue might come in a little higher than you had originally budgeted, or expenses may have come in a little lower than were originally budgeted. Okay. And that's what's creating that, that net position gap. This type of project is, or this type of reserve is simply saying we are committing as an agency to make sure that we set aside so much budget allocation every year towards some maintenance, uh, infrastructure maintenance projects. It's not creating a new fund, or you know what I mean, a new fund of any sort. It's just com making that commitment to funding infrastructure projects. During Do you the have cycle. a recommendation for an amount to have in there that would make sense? Because I, I know there's multiple maintenance projects. As you've identified, <laughs> we have a lot of different maintenance projects that we that Mostly we replacing mains that Mostly need to be Mostly replacing replaced. mains, and I, and I can tell you easily that um, 1.3 million itself would probably do one, maybe one and a half main replacement projects, depending on the size. There's also uh, tank recoats, um, right. uh, pump replacements. Uh, sometimes we reach the point where a well isn't um, performing as well as anticipated, so we do well rehabs. So all of those type of projects are the ones that we would consider so this there, allocation for. Is there a recommended amount? 80% um, of the 1.3 million would probably a good, be a good start on getting this through this process. Okay. And then the, those projects that have been the ones that we prioritized in that workshop, is that, Yes. Right. So, so we'd say we'd prioritize our projects and then we'd say, well, we've got a, a million dollars that we want to dedicate toward the infrastructure maintenance projects. Let's make sure we pull those out and use this allocation to fund those. I heartily agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments, Bruce? I'm, I'm a fan of doing maintenance. I'm, I, I like us doing it. Uh, if we had no discipline at all, then putting something together like this would be a great idea. But, you know, every year that we have excess money, you know, Taj has done a great job of putting together like, like a 10-year list of projects. If we have excess funds, we almost always take that money and pull the top one off the list and do it. And I don't see the reason of having this structure created for that at all. It doesn't, it, it doesn't really accomplish anything in my mind. It, it's kind of just creating a fund just to create a fund. and. And I don't see any difference in keeping it in the general fund. And if we have extra, let's do a project. Let's let's do some maintenance. So, that's that's absolutely an option. 
we could elect not to fund the infrastructure maintenance reserve. The, the reason this kind of came to light during the last budget process is we were pulling a whole list of program or a whole list of projects that needed to be funded. I think we had close to 60 projects and we could only fund about 12. And what's happening is um, there's a lot of these replacement and maintenance projects that are kind of falling by the wayside because we're funding some higher priority items. Um, so what happens is they kind of get the short shift in that budget project selection process. So you're seeing this fund just as for small things then? Not big? Anything that's infrastructure maintenance related. So it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be going to supplemental supply. It wouldn't be going to um, a, a new infrastructure asset necessarily, but it would be going to maintain the existing infrastructure. I think when staff gets together and divvies up the budget for various activities, I think you know we 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 do that. And we should do that. But I don't see the re need to create this fund to especially to do that. So. Well, I actually can see the thing because it was happening even in that the workshop that we had, which I thought was very effective and it was really worthwhile, that uh, to get all input to prioritize projects. But you can see what happens on a, on a month to month basis, just being in the <coughs> getting the review at the board meetings, is that some of these projects that aren't critical, like the clubhouse drive main replacements is sort of a critical mm -hmm. project. So that does get elevated, but then a lot of other things like, were not, they didn't seem high priority, but they still cause a lot of uh, disruption in the water system. Well, I was thinking of the Stockton Bridge uh, replacement that, that, you know, that is like a crisis that could happen, you know, a little earthquake or something like that. So I, I could see the, the reason to protect, some, make sure we're protecting money for infrastructure repair. Those projects probably experience more slippage than other yes, projects. Yes, they're not broken Which is yet. what we were trying to kind they're of address. They're not broken. Yeah. So they only become repaired once it's an emergency situation. So having one, something there uh, for an immediate repair would be really good. I am supportive of it. So I move that we do do that. that Fund we have it to the, what level? Uh, that I don't know. It might need a recommendation on funding right. level. Well, your first motion is just to adopt this reserve. <coughs> yes. Do okay. that. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Okay. So dies. Okay. Yeah. So no, see, no reason to go to the next one. No. No. All right. We will go to item six point four. You've got me for that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> we last had a um, rate study done in 2015, and it was performed by Hoxley Consulting. And at that time, um, we elected to retain our existing um, inclining tier rate structure. And I think one of the things we've discovered as a result of the uh, drought scenarios that we've experienced over the last few years is it's very difficult um, for that type of rate structure to be sustainable in periods of declining consumption. So what we're proposing here is we are proposing um, the next rate study that needs to be done would be to have rates in place for January 2019. And so that's about two years out. What we're proposing is the formation of a um, rate committee. It would be a temporary committee we would meet as needed in order to take a look at some alternative rate structures out there and see if any of those would um, be something that we would like to consider implementing here at the district. It would be to help us identify um, an appropriate consultant to do our next finance plan and rate study to help develop the RFP for that uh, consultant and then to help engage in public outreach around um, new rates or a new rate structure if that's what we choose to do. So our recommendation in this instance was to, do, was to um, form a temporary rate committee to have it uh, staffed by um, board members, staff, and hopefully members of our public and to get input on what we'd like our rate structure to look like going forward. Is there any idea of how to advertise to public 
members? <laughs> we, we have kind of considered that. Um, what we had done with the rest of our standing committees is we had a pool from which we kind of were able to select because we had had some interest in board positions. Mm -hmm. um, that list has, um, is a little bit older now, and we've also utilized some members off of that list for our existing standing committees. So we're considering the idea of um, taking our outreach efforts and going ahead and putting out the notice that we are um, looking for members who would be interested in serving on a rate committee and then going ahead and taking a look and evaluating the input and, and applications we receive from that and see who would be So advertising in newspaper? Probably an email blast, um, a press release that would get picked up, usually like something in coastlines okay. and on our website. Yeah. Okay. Um, any public comment on this? <coughs> Thank you. I'm Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. And my concern with um, rate structuring is that your board does look at uh, people who are on very low income, fixed income. In my uh, discussions with people at the farmer's market, you already have customers who cannot afford to pay their water bill. They have to try and figure out something else to cut to pay their water. And I will remind you about the um, piece of ordinance, for lack of a better word, that is before the State Water Board, and that is uh, basic human right to affordable, safe water. So um, yeah. Mr. Duncan has mentioned that your district is looking into some sort of assistance, but in terms of rate structuring, I think you've really got to look at keeping the affordability uh, where people on fixed and very low incomes can afford to have the basic human need of water. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right. So, any volunteers? Well, I think clearly we should put Directors Jaffe on it. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Do they object? <laughs> no objection from them. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's a fine idea, and I think it's going to be a complicated decision about whether to go to water budgets or, or, a, strict or a tiered structure. And mm -hmm. so I'll volunteer. So will I. All right. I'll move that we um, appoint directors Daniels and Christensen to the rate committee and establish the committee and, and, and direct staff to um, advertise and, and incorporate two public members. Okay. Second? Yeah, that's, I, th I think the size that the other committees are. Okay. Any second? Second. Okay. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, good. Thank you for being willing to serve on that. We have one finance too? Or yeah. Finance? Okay. All right. Carl um, is on finance now. Okay. And mid year budget adjustments. So last year during the budget um, formulation process, another thing we looked at doing was. Um, as I said, we had about 60 projects in the queue, and we could only fund about 12 of them. So what was discussed is that we would include both funded and unfunded projects that we were considering in the budget document. And we would reevaluate mid-year to determine whether or not the projects that we had selected were f for funding were projects that um, we were going to go ahead and be able to complete um, this fiscal year. Sometimes projects stall because um, of delays in, in permitting or, or delays in, in getting the bid out and getting responses and regulatory delays, all that type of thing. So sometimes these projects don't move as quickly as we'd like, but we didn't want to see us tie up budget funds on projects that we didn't think we were going to be able to complete at this point in the fiscal year at the exclusion of projects that, that didn't get funded. So what we're bringing back to you mid-year here is a list of projects that um, we don't feel we're likely to complete this fiscal year. Some of them were funded through PAYGO funding and some of them are funded through the certificates of participation. They're not projects that we're not going to consider completing, it's just we're not going to be able to get them done this fiscal year. So what we'd like to do is go ahead and take the 1.5 million 
um, that's available in PAYGO funding and the $1.2 million we feel is available in COP funding and go ahead and utilize them on by reclassifying some of the unfunded projects to funded status. So I've given you a list of projects we don't think we're going to complete or we don't think are going to utilize the full budget that had been allocated to them. And I've given you a list of projects that we'd like to consider reclassifying. Only one of those projects is something that is um, probably going to be able to be funded out of the COP funds because in order to fund them out of COP funds, the project has to be a long-term asset that lasts as long as the life of the borrowing. So it has right. to be in place 30 years or more. So Clubhouse Drive Main Replacement, which you guys have already um, addressed at the last board meeting, is probably the only one we can reclassify it for COP, and then the rest would be funded out of PAYGO funding. That one will save some water, I think. Any public comment on this item? Okay. Board comment? Yes, sir. I, I like both the changes being proposed and I like the process. You're know, doing it this way, I un understand, and I like this. So. Is that a motion? Uh, yeah. I'll second. <laughs> Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. And uh, the Next item is, and last item I think, is um, recommended enhancement to facilitate written public submittals. Yeah, you, you know, public input and comments from the public is crucial to the board. We've seen that tonight. You take it to heart. We've seen processes adjusted all along the way, projects modified to get the best uh, resolution possible. Um, a couple board meetings ago, and I think the last board meeting you asked staff to agendize when it might be reasonable for, uh, give some uh, expectation to the, um, to the public when they might be able to submit written comments, um, specifically after the, uh, in relation to after when the board packet is published, and expect a, um, but it could be any, on anything, and expect uh, the board to have time to digest it and incorporate in formulating their decisions and, and whatnot during the meeting. So what we've done quite simply is we looked at what other agencies have incorporated and basically we're proposing this language right here be added to the agenda in this format. At the bottom of the current agenda, you have all this text except what's in yellow. And we're uh, suggesting reorganize that text in a little more easily reading, readable format for the public and add this part in yellow. So what that amounts to is for Tuesday board meetings, if, if you accept the proposal by staff, is um, for people to submit by 9 a.m. on Monday before the Tuesday night board meeting, um, that material uh, be submitted to the board members or to the board clerk and then we'll get it out as quickly as possible and you know it may not always uh, be applicable today's a great day a great time if somebody submitted something yesterday on Monday it would happen to be a holiday so we might not have been there to distribute it to you and that sort of thing but in general um, that's what we're proposing and that's the text we we suggest inserting and since I discussed this at length I just you know I wanted to make sure people had a chance to see the agenda and still make a comment but I wanted people to understand that if stuff that's handed us long, long written things that are handed to us at the board meeting, we can't really have time to read. And so this gives kind of a nice, what I think, compromise where you know you, you got a couple of days to write something and get it in after you've seen the agenda and and had a chance to digest it, and then we have a chance to read it and not and before we before we hear that item. So I like it. Any, pub any public comment on this item? Um, I, I think the change is a good one myself. I'm sorry. Yes, Becky. Uh, Becky Steinbrenner, thank you. I really want to thank you for making this change because the other change didn't make sense to block off public comment before the agenda was even made public. So I really want to thank you. Good. Okay. So, Bruce. Um, just to make things work, I think that yellow bullet item does not belong under the, the subject, which is please obey, observe the following procedures for addressing the board on agendized items, uh, because this is stuff that's happening before the board meeting. Oh, yeah, so I would take that bullet out and combine it with the first sentence of the 
packet which says submittal of written correspondence, oh, et cetera. Okay. Those two belong together because yeah. they're really the same subject. And it's not really about what happens at the board meetings. We have to get rid of that one that's... Well, actually, it just replace it. It replaces that one. Mm -hmm. The second line on that. Um, the any additional? Well, the, oh no, you're right. It's added. You're right. Okay. I get it. It's added. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because it's not just comments on board right. items. It can be right, right. Any, about anything. We want to leave that. And and just to be clear, there was never any. Uh, the policy right. doesn't inhibit anything. Okay. Just to be incorporated into the packet, it has to. Yeah. It has to be done by a certain time. Right. Where, where every all the staff has to have it done by then too. Yeah. So um, it made sense. That's a good point, Bruce. And as another thing, to, just to clarify things, I don't know if we can do it tonight, given it's not suggested here, but we should probably add something in that um, thing about you know the the uh, people have to address the board. We should say something that about people addressing the board are not capable of calling out other people to to speak, so they can't address questions to the staff oh. to have to address it and so forth. They, all they can do is address the board. They can ask questions, but then they can't call to Taj and say, Taj, t spend the next 20 minutes tell me about X, Y, Z. No, it's it's public comment. It's public comment. And the questions, we, we want to have questions answered, and, and it's hard sometimes, but it just, the meetings just don't run smoothly if we So saying something there. like, you know, the, in, in their public comment, people can ask questions, but <coughs> questions will not be answered at that time by anybody. Mm -hmm. Or may not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We may just um, add some language to that to the packet. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, President Lahu, can I just ask yes, a, a clarification? The the point above that says the submittal of written correspondence mm -hmm. must re be received by 4 p.m. on the Wednesday prior to the board meeting be part of the packet, which that is on the, the agenda, right? Yeah. It's just the correspondence related to an item that they want to that's on the agenda for consideration would have this new um, timeline? And you want to pull that out? About no, I, the first line should still be there. This just is in addition to it. It's just the... the oh, I see. Yes. And, and, that, yeah. and something done on Wednesday oh, may not be on the agenda, <coughs> but it may accidentally be on the agenda. So they, they don't know whether it is or not. So in any case, it would be made part of the packet. It may be just written communication at the end, or it might be added to a, an agenda item if that's yeah. appropriate. Yeah. And President Lahue, yes. just as a matter of policy, if something is made available to the board on Monday at 10 or whatever, then it has to be available to the public at the same time. Yes. So copies are available at the back at the meeting? As well, well, no, and also at the, at the office, just like anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Under the Brown Act. Or on In the fact, line? if they could be put on the website. I see. Sure. Just mm -hmm. post it on the website. Sure. Part of the packet? Part of the minutes? That's, that, this is well, the part that was confusing me originally. Yeah. My, other com my previous comment that was wrong because um, I couldn't read that, what it said very well. But anyway, I, um, yeah, the, the difference between these letters and then the, the letters uh, that we just got this any morning or yesterday, any last night, was the, um, and then the letter that's at the end of the, board packet, what is the difference between those two things? Something at the end is not on the agenda. There is no agenda item for that. So for example, no, this there is an agenda item on, on one letter be because it got here on Wednesday. So what's the difference? You're saying, okay, so yeah, let me see if I can clarify. If written correspondence comes before Wednesday, it, it can be included into the packet that goes out on Friday. Yeah, as written correspondence. It, anything after that before 9 a.m. on Monday that we receive, you know, we're just telling people that then the board has a chance to read that. Okay. Mr. Basso is pointing out that if we get something that gets distributed to board members, you know, and the public needs to have access to that too, which just makes sense. Right. And Maybe we should have, a, the law. have an item that instead just to allow for the letters that would be written correspondence received by Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Or something like that to... I think the point is that um, they may not anticipate what's on the agenda. So we, we always allow, people can write us anything they want, anytime they want, we'll receive it and, we, and basically we get it out to the board right. as quickly as possible. However... Well actually, you know, since our schedule is out two months and ahead, people might 
send us something that they know is going to be on the agenda, or at least mm -hmm. we've told them it's going to be mm -hmm. on the agenda, mm -hmm. and therefore that letter should go with that agenda item. So, for example, Rosemary is coming to speak with us. Right. If someone submits something about Rosemary and the whatever, mm -hmm. then that should be part of that agenda item because it's not just random written correspondence. It's about that item. So, I mean, in, in, let me make sure I'm clear, and Mr. Basso, please help us. So, if, if, if somebody was going to, let's say, Rosemary was going to present in a month, somebody wrote a letter two Tomorrow. months ahead of time, mm -hmm. you're suggesting holding that letter and making it no, part? No, okay. no, no, no. Okay. I'm just saying that if, if when we go to assemble the packet, mm -hmm. if there are letters that we've gotten that address that oh. agenda item, they should be included under that agenda item. Or Again? Stuffed at the end of the back of okay. it. Okay. Yeah, we could put as a, a, a what an attachment? Is that what you do? Yes. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Rather than just as attachment. Yeah. Under, if it comes in, if it comes in in time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But that doesn't need to be in this announcement. He's no, just talking about how it's organized in the right. in the in the packet. All right. So with the with the movement of this statement up to where written correspondence is dealt with. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then. Um, I'll move we approve that language. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. So I think that is all. Um, and there, except there, for our closed session. There are no closed sessions. Oh, we have no closed is, session. There is one written communication. Right. There's a letter about duplexes. And there's also one well, those that I received after the board packet, correct. and it's in front of you, and it's also back on the table. We got it on email. Great. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.